Hey Gen Zers, this is Mackenzie Amix with today's Gen Z with Mackenzie, and today we're joined by Adam Natoli, who is the Assistant Professor of Psychology at Sam Houston Uni State University. Welcome, Adam. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Of course. So you specialize in personality and the psychology behind personality. So can you tell us in a scientific definition, what even is personality classified as? That's a pretty complicated question. In simplest of terms, personality is who we are. Um, it's this part of ourselves and this lens through which we experience the world, our feelings, our thoughts, um, how we interact with other people, how we understand ourselves. It's kind of this all encompassing aspect of who you are as a person. For sure. So what's the science that goes into studying personality and how do we classify different types of personalities? That's actually a great question and an argument that's going on in personality research at the moment. So we study personality in a lot of different ways using a lot of different kinds of measures and there are kind of two thoughts of how to best understand personality um, especially when it comes to personality pathology like personality disorders there's this one kind of camp that thinks there are these categorical types of personality um, and then there's this other camp which i tend to favor which sees personality more as dimensional. Um, so you're not just say, you know, you don't just have a narcissistic personality or you don't have a narcissistic personality, but you're somewhere on this spectrum between low narcissism and high narcissism. And so to, for us to understand personality, we look to see where people are on all these different traits, as well as how they are in terms of what's called self-functioning and interpersonal functioning, which is that how you engage with yourself and how you engage with others that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So when we're studying personality and trying to um, look at an individual and gauge what kind of spectrum they're on with different traits, how do we go about that? And is there a way that we can um, gauge that data in a very pure way without kind of um, other things that kind of cloud the judgment between that? There are, there are a lot of ways to measure personality. Um, for the most part, people will use self-report measures. So these are, you know, questionnaires, things like that. But there are also implicit measures. You could use behavioral measures or observations. And each of these are measuring what are called latent variables. And in psychology, unlike other sciences where, you know, say in chemistry, if you're measuring heat or in medicine, if you're measuring weight, you can use very direct measures. You know, you could have someone stand on a scale and it'll tell you how much they weigh. In psychology, the constructs that we work with, you know, emotions, personality, we can't just put them on a scale. Yeah. Right? And so these are what are called latent variables. Um, so they're not really tangible. They're not physical. And so we have to be a little creative in how we measure them. So self reports, usually what happens is you ask a bunch of questions that you believe are related to whatever construct you're measuring, say anxiety, right? Or depression. Um, and then you kind of aggregate or add all those up and you kind of get this score that you say represents depression. Um, but when you do with different methods of measuring things, so that's self-report, there's also implicit measures, which will measure your automatic associations with different things. Um, in simpler terms, you could think of it as, you know, understanding the unconscious parts of something. Um, both of these, we say measure the same thing, right? Anxiety, but they measured in different ways. And so they're actually measuring slightly different things. And we need to understand what we're measuring in those contexts. 
And because of that, the best way to measure something to get the most precise and comprehensive understanding of whatever you're measuring, you want to use different kinds of methods, right? And then you look at, well, where do they converge? How did they agree? Um, and what some of my research is looking at is when these measures don't agree, right? Mm -hmm. So why might someone look depressed on a self-report but not depressed on an implicit measure. Um, and so we have all these different methods for measuring what we look at. Um, and I am of the belief that a multi-method approach is the best way to go. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're dealing with something that's so um, abstract and it can't be, like you said, like physics or chemistry measured down to a certain number or decimal, I think definitely having that rounded perspective is important to be able to get the most accurate representation that you can. So it's really interesting that you bring up um, the research that you're doing where self-reports don't match up with kind of um, third party um, reports of the same person and their traits. So um, you define personality as kind of who we are and how we perceive ourselves, which are not the same thing. So how far can that gap between self-perception and then other people's perception of ourselves, how far can that gap get? And what, what are the reasons for that? It could be completely opposite sides of the spectrum. Um, I've had patients where I was looking at, um, you know, affect and, you know, their mood. And uh, I'm thinking of one individual who their self-report said no emotional issues, like nothing, right? And then their implicit measures were saying, no, there's actually quite a bit of emotional turmoil going on. And okay, so how does that make sense, right? It's not just that one measure is better than the other, right? It's not that one's right and one's wrong. Well, when it came to this individual, what was actually going on is they were experiencing a lot of emotional distress, but they didn't want to upset their parents. They didn't want their parents to know that they were dealing with these emotions because their parents were dealing with their own kind of difficulties at the time and they didn't want to burden their parents. So they are experiencing these emotions, but they present themselves as, you know, fine. Um, so you can see people and their scores being on complete opposites. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons for this. And it's those reasons that I think are incredibly important. Um, because once you can understand those reasons, uh, and the different methods have different reasons, like self reports, there is obviously someone could lie, right? Um, but even if they're being faithful, maybe they want to present in a certain way, or if they're participating in research, maybe they want to help the researcher out by, you know, giving them data that they think will prove whatever they're studying. Um, or maybe they just don't understand their anxiety very well, and so they don't know what's really going on. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why those scores could vary. And with implicit measures, you know, there are reasons why those could vary too. If you're doing an implicit measure and say it's in the, you know, start of the day, you're a little tired, right? Well, those associations in your mind, those automatic associations are going to be a little bit different than, you know, if it's the middle of the day and you're feeling, you know, at the peak of your energy for that day. And then we also see others in behaviors, right? We could interpret behaviors different ways um, when we get uh, informant reports. So if you ask you know, someone's friend to rate them, those are gonna be impacted by how that person obviously behaves, but also how does their friend tend to perceive other people in general? So there are a lot of things that go into or impact these scores. So they're not perfect representations of what we say we're measuring. For sure. 
So when people are, you know, doing self-assessments, would you say when it comes to more negative traits or negative emotions that it's more of um, a denial or would you say it's more of a disillusionment where they're not kind of aware of that within themselves and they're kind of bottling that down so that they're not even fully conscious of that? I, I love that question. And it's both and more. <laughs> so what some of my research is doing is understanding people's personality and how that influences their performance on these different measures, right? So part of our personality, we have different personality styles and those styles, part of them are made up of these characteristic beliefs about ourselves or others or these central goals that we have. Um, so someone who has a dependent personality, um, higher in what's called interpersonal dependency, one of their main goals is to maintain or strengthen relationships with others. And so however they perform or when they take a self-report or any other measure or really do anything, that goal is going to influence their behavior or their performance. Sometimes that may mean that they on a self-report want to appear, you know, more depressed than they actually are because maybe in their their understanding is if i appear more depressed i'll get more help from the doctor however if it's you know they might want to appear less depressed because they may think well if i appear too depressed you know my fiance may not like me anymore mm -hmm. and maybe they'll leave me so it really comes down to that goal of that is influenced by our personality. That's really interesting that you mentioned kind of goal-driven um, actions. And even when it comes to being self-aware of your own personality traits and actions. So um, kind of pivoting it a little bit, there are so many myths about personality. What personalities there are, how we should talk about and think about personality. So I was wondering, um, how much can personality change over time? And does it truly change over time? Or is it based on um, kind of outside factors, environmental factors, or is it based on like we were talking about our perception of ourselves and how that changes over time? So for a long time, the common belief, the common agreement was that personality is entirely rigid, right? Once, you know, through development, through childhood, once you kind of solidify this personality, that's your personality. Um, but, and then, you know, there were some beliefs that through say, you know, psychoanalysis and other therapy, long-term therapies, that personality can be modified, but it would take years. Now we're coming along and starting to think that personality is a little bit more flexible less rigid than we originally thought. That yes, it is still kind of rigid, um, but there's some flexibility, you know, even within a day, day to day, but most of that flexibility is due to interactions between personality and, you know, like you were saying, environmental factors or, you know, other idiosyncratic factors such as you know, are you in a positive mood that day versus, you know, are you having uh, one of those bad days? Um, so the behaviors that manifest because of our personality can change moment to moment. But personality is a little bit more rigid than that. But over the long term, it can, can shift. Um, and a lot of that comes from or starts with that kind of self-awareness of, well, what is my personality? Why do I do the things that I do? Why do I think the way that I think? Um, why do I respond to the way I respond to different things? Mm -hmm. And then kind of working with that to shift it the way you want. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, kind of that mindfulness that you said can kind of shift um, and shape us into the person that we would like to be. 
So when it comes to personality, it's obviously very multifaceted. And, um, you know, the traditional belief that it's completely rigid that you form this personality. And so what is that that's at the core of our, you know, our personality, our essence, who we are as a person? And when does that begin to form? Is it you know, since our birth that it starts to form? Um, and when is, does it stop? And kind of, is that completely rigid? And what encompasses that part that is the most rigid, you know, essence of ourself? There are, there are a lot of interesting questions there. I think personality starts forming immediately. Um, and I'm not too familiar with the like literature on it or, um, like during pregnancy, inner utero um, development of like or contributions to personality, but there is research about how there are some genetic underpinnings to personality. But for the most part, our personality develops between birth and you know up until late adolescence. That's where the biggest changes tend to be, um, you know, except for when there are notable events in your life that may, you know, such as going into therapy, then you could see dramatic changes. Um, but for the most part, it's between birth and late adolescence that our core personalities are developing. And our core personalities are being understood as these two different parts. So there's this personality functioning, which is that self-functioning and interpersonal functioning. So how do we think of ourselves? How do we relate to ourselves? How do we interact with others? How close can we get with other people is kind of this one part. And then this other part is personality traits. Um, so the big five and then, you know, can be broken down into 25 facets. And there's all different ways that people are dividing up um, personality traits, but it generally funnels down to those big five personality traits. And those are gonna vary a little bit, but they're, these two parts are what tend to be the most rigid. Um, but like I was saying before, personality can shift. There can be changes in your personality throughout your entire life. Um, you know, Whether you're a teenager or whether you're in your 90s, there are things that can, you know, if you put work into it, can start shifting your personality as we understand it. For sure, for sure. That's really interesting. So you mentioned, I just want to touch on it briefly. What are the five, um, you know, definitive personality traits that kind of are the umbrella branch for so many other things? So there are a couple of different terms for them, but generally it's openness. Con so openness to new experience, conscientiousness, agreeableness, um, neuroticism or negative affect, um, and extroversion, introversion. That's fascinating. So obviously it's so important and it's been the goal of, you know, the human race since the beginning of time to just be able to understand ourselves as individuals and as a society as well. So can you tell us a little bit more? We talked about it just a little bit before um, of your most of the research that you're working on right now and its importance. Sure. So my research, a lot of it's been looking at the psychological processes that people engage in during the assessment process. So what psychological processes are engaged when you're filling out a self-report compared to when you're filling out an implicit measure. And my research is continuing to look at that um, and things that influence that such as someone's personality. So how does personality influence the way you take a self-report test? Um, but is also growing to start looking at the physiological underpinnings of the assessment process. So, you know, how does heart rate or your um, skin conductance change or when you're doing a self-report compared to doing a performance-based measure? Um, and what can that tell us about what's going on and how can that help us kind of improve our ability to measure what we're measuring because we could kind of account for the errors 
associated with these processes. Yeah, definitely. And we mentioned before the gap between that kind of um, takes away from the accuracy of the, you know, the original intent of these assessments, which is where a, there's, an, there's a, a big gap between, you know, personality and your goals and the actions that you take based on those goals. So can we use these ideas to understand people and, you know, how they work and the actions that they take versus kind of their innate, you know, what they would like to do versus what they actually manifest into doing? Absolutely. I mean, if you look like at that case um, example I was giving, just with these two tests, we were able to kind of not only identify what the internal experiences of emotion were, but also identify how this individual preferred to present themselves. And then by having both of them, we were able to see that discrepancy and understand why there was that discrepancy mm -hmm. after you know talking to the individual about it. And so these can really help us understand how people behave, why they behave the way they do, um, and help people understand themselves a little bit better by looking at these different results from different methods of measuring the same thing and looking at them within those contexts, but also looking at how they compare. That's really fascinating. So you also do clinical training and can you tell us a little bit about that? How, you know, you deal with um, seeing patients and kind of that process? Sure. So clinical training um, and the ability to do clinical work, it varies a little bit state by state, but generally in terms of psychology, you need either a master's degree or a doctorate degree. And so a lot of education, um, a lot of school, but you know, it's a little bit better. I didn't really like high school, but I loved college because it was stuff that I enjoyed. Um, and so you start with that and then you start training with actual clients or actual patients. And this could be in all kinds of settings, whether it's what's called an outpatient clinic, which is usually individuals who are doing relatively well in their lives, they're functioning, but maybe there's an area of their life that they're having a little trouble with, or they wanna feel better than they're feeling. Mm -hmm. But I've also done training in a school, in a school system, working with children. I've also done training at, on Rikers Island, uh, work, which is a New York City's uh, largest jail. Um, working with individuals there, and then also in state psychiatric hospitals and state forensic hospitals. Um, so really, my training has spanned, you know, people who, between people who are, you know, just having a little bit of trouble because maybe they just started college and they're a little anxious living away from home, to people who are having real difficulties living out in the community because they're living with you know severe mental illness um, such as schizophrenia or other mental illnesses yeah and that's such a wide range to be interacting with all these different types of people so as you are kind of dealing with all these different patients different ages you know some that are children they're just beginning to form their personalities the core of themselves and some that are dealing with more severe mental illnesses um, some that are in prison. Um, how has learning about these other people and studying their personalities made you reflect upon your own personality? You, I think the biggest takeaway is that we are all a lot more similar than we are different in so many ways. And there are times where you'll be working with a client and you'll, you know, you'll think to yourself, you know what, I struggle with that too. And when you have those kind of thoughts, or really anytime you have questions, you do, you go to supervision, or you consult a colleague, and you try to understand yourself. 
and you try and understand why you were having those thoughts as well as you know how are those how might those thoughts have been impacting the treatment for better or worse mm -hmm. um, because you don't want your self to be impacting the treatment in a negative way but we are as clinicians as psychologists we are some of our best tools right the way we feel with a client is probably how other people feel with that client as well and so we can use ourselves as tools to better understand the individual but you have to understand yourself really well to be able to use yourself as a good tool yeah and that's a really um kind of fascinating point that you know your own personality and being able to relate to your clients can either be your biggest strength with them but it can also kind of be a, a weak point. Um, yeah, but I think overall, just being able to recognize that humans are so similar. And even if we we are trained, our minds are trained to, you know, see the differences, us versus them, you know, compare yourself to different people, but finding out that we're all just very similar and we can relate to each other is such a wonderful epiphany. So thank you so much for sharing. Of course. So today we've been joined by Dr. Adam Natoli, who is the assistant professor of psychology at St Sam Houston State University. Thanks so much for being here with me today. Thank you. I loved it.